We're going to start off with some commentary from the respondents from each of the sessions, going in order from Dr. Albrighton to Stephen Lewis. Uh, Drs. John and Betsy Burry are going to be joined by Shan Landry, um, and then Ryan Miley. And each of you are going to kind of summarize stuff. We'll have a little bit of a conversation and another coffee break. So can I ask Dr. Albrighton to start, start us off? Thank you. Our session was on the future of health or health care education, depending upon where you read it in the, uh, in the program. Uh, it was facilitated by Dr. Laurie Hansen, and uh, Laura Hopkins was the recorder. Uh, I think it was a wonderful discussion. It covered a wide variety of areas. And what impressed me in reading these is by looking at just the session that we were in, uh, there was so much sharing of, uh, of the thoughts. Health education is a complex adaptive system, so what you see can't necessarily be explained by linear logic. And most importantly, it is largely uninformed by societal needs and by public policy. So to summarize a very long conversation, I wanted to cover really just two particular areas and see how they uh, resonate with you. The first has to do with admissions. Uh, there is good data that health care, the best health care, is provided by people who are like the patients who are receiving the care. So that medical education or health science education needs to look at the demography of the people uh, that they are uh, designed to address. Part of that is indicated in the social accountability framework that we currently operate under in medicine. Uh, that I indicates that we have to engage the societies that, that we serve and to meet the needs of our current society. So a number of things have been done over the years with regards to admissions, some of which are, uh, we should all be quite proud of. Uh, the male-female ratio in medicine, at least, is about 50-50. Uh, the other health science professions, however, are very heavily predominantly female. And so the actual gender balance in health sciences needs to be addressed. Uh, Aboriginal uh, admissions is addressed through most of the pro uh, uh, programs uh, and other visible minorities. Some places actually look at rural uh, as a source of origin. And we currently looking for diversity except a small portion, at least in medicine, of outer province students. Uh, but we still do not accept students from outside of Canada. There are a number of things that have changed in terms of the admission, at least to medicine, which were largely uh, totally academically driven. And currently, we consider a number of non-academic uh, uh, indicators as well, most heavily through the mini me uh, uh, medical interview process, in which students go through a panel of 10 different stations and answer questions, looking for non-academic indicators uh, that we think will uh, result in successful physicians. There are problems, however, uh, and we need to, again, as uh, Roy Romano mentioned this morning, begin to look at some upstream issues with regards to education. Uh, primary and secondary education is extremely important for the ultimate entry into health sciences education, and we need to increasingly begin to own, as the professional educators, uh, those problems that exist in primary and secondary education, the imbalance between educational opportunities in rural and urban areas, uh, and many of the other upstream issues prior to getting into the professions. In addition, at least for medicine, it's becoming increasingly a profession of the economically privileged. And so individuals who get into medicine uh, are economically privileged and come from very, very supportive environments. So it's particularly poignant that someone was pointing out today how difficult it would be because you would not be able to meet the admissions criteria for medicine if all you were able to do was to be a part-time student uh, and you had not uh, had the kind of supportive environment that would allow you to achieve the entry. And yet a large number of people who are being provided care uh, come from those kinds of background. And to meet that demographic need, uh, those issues should be addressed. Solutions, however, require public policy. The other area we discussed about was with regards to curriculum. Currently, most health sciences are uh, educating in a siloed environment. Uh, medical education dates back, or the current form dates back 100 years to a report from the United States 
um, by Flexner, and very little has changed. Uh, a little bit of tinkering here and there, but fundamental change has not occurred for the past 100 years. The future, however, uh, is dictated by interprofessional education, and especially here. What you see when you came here is the largest capital project in the history of the University of Saskatchewan, and it must be about interprofessional education. It's premised on interprofessional education, and it has to be more than a building space. So how do we achieve interprofessional education in those buildings that are going up across the street? Because there are systemic barriers. Every curriculum has time constraints, but time is a priority. And so interprofessional education has to become the priority for all of the health sciences in order to create the time in the curriculum that will allow it to develop in that manner. In addition, there are questions with regards to resources. Each discipline tends to teach themselves rather than to effectively organizing the education. And again, another example in our session, um, one of the individuals was telling about three of their children, one who was in kinesiology, one who was in nursing, and one who was in medicine. And they were comparing their current work with regards to the musculoskeletal system. Uh, they were all learning the same, all taught by different professionals, when one professional could probably teach that area as well. So unless we model interprofessional education in the building across the street, um, we won't be able to successfully achieve our outcomes. In addition, we had a significant uh, discussion around what is referred to as the hidden curriculum. That is, that's not the formal curriculum that's taught. You can't see it in the syllabus. Uh, what it, it is is the acculturation of the individual learners within their own professional environment. And there's excellent data that shows that that curriculum profoundly influences how health professionals see their profession from the time they enter their professional education program until the time they graduate. But even more importantly, we cannot have a program across the street that educates interprofessionally if the professionals, when they enter the workforce, do not see an interprofessional environment. There are very perverse incentives within our workplace. Fee for service, debt load of outcome, choice of specialty, non-direct care issues with regards to nursing, scope of practice all of which determine ultimately how successful and how happy individual professionals will be. So I think in those two areas of, ad of admissions and curriculum, we have a long way to go in order to meet uh, the desire that we talk about today. So thank you. Well, John and Betsy are coming forward. Um, I will uh, just reiterate what Armin had explained to you all. Um, we were starting off in two separate rooms, and uh, when we realized that there was a smaller um, number of, of people in each of our rooms, we decided after a quick confab that we could uh, amalgamate the two, which maybe in some ways um, already suggests to us uh, some of the threads of cooperation um, and working for the common good that uh, underlies some of our basic values and principles of the system. Um, but uh, both of us, or all of us, all three of us, uh, looked up at the wall and, and saw what had been uh, presented here as a summary. And uh, obviously those who were taking notes did a great job and much better than I could at being succinct about what we came up with. I had a few comments about values and vision that I wanted to make, um, but maybe I'll ask uh, Betsy and John just to talk a little bit about public participation first and some of, of those points that we came up with in our group. I think the interesting thing that one learned very quickly was there's an awful lot of people who aren't participating because of in inaccessibility. And not the obvious ones, which we all know about, are the Aboriginal people and the people in the rural communities, but there lots of, one person who just come back from Mexico said he had better contact with social services in Mexico than he has in Saskatchewan. He couldn't get into the system when he got here. And I think this, we know how many people are hunting around for doctors in the middle of the night because one of their kids is sick. There's no, they don't have a contact with the doctor. Then in addition to, we know about the, the difficulties of people in the country, but there are many seniors even in the city that are dissociated from the system now. They become, they're by themselves, they've lost contact because of families. And unless they can go across the road to go to the grocery store, when it comes to medicine, they're in great trouble. So in accessibility, 
has probably declined since we started Medicare. That's my suspicion, because communities worked much better when we, in 1962 than they do now. And uh, we've become, instead of being a community so, uh, society, we've become a family society. And I also think that the other part that was important is that we've improved our technology. We've gotten very clever at taking tests, and I felt that after hearing Stephen, I thought our group should have been with his group too, because that's the way we felt. And I, as spending 20 years uh, being the health ombudsman, where I listened to the patients' complaints, it seemed to me that, that we have not done a good job in the um, end of informing education uh, for people. Our, uh, the results of the money spent has been indicated as not being effective, as it should be, and therefore I think that we have to really take a look at uh, redesigning the, the whole, the whole um, uh, program of health care and talk about health care, not just treatment care. And I think that was one of our major objectives in the talk, and we had some very, very good discussions about that. Um, in, in some ways, I had uh, also imagined that we would conclude our discussions today with something on the vision and values because uh, what I think was revealed in our discussions this morning was that all these other elements that are being described here are what comprise the backbone that drives us to creating a vision for the future um, and also basing it in our values. And uh, we had quite a lively discussion about what are our values um, are they the same as they were before? Uh, I mentioned the fact that Andrew Picard had written in the Globe and Mail a few weeks ago as a part of an excerpt from his, uh, his dissertation for the Conference Board of Canada Scholar in Residence, the fact that when Medicare was created 50 years ago, uh, the average age of Canadians was 27. And they used the healthcare system really to be born, to die and for some episodic treatment, mostly surgery in between. So their vision of what, was, what they wanted and what they could imagine needing in the future was bound by who they were at that time. If we look now at the fact that uh, the average age of Canadians is more like 47 or 49, that we have many more chronic diseases and as was pointed out in our group as well, our whole definition of health has changed and evolved. So we had some discussion as well about uh, a vision evolving and growing to fit the context of the culture that is driving it in the first place. The lively discussion about values had to do with whether or not uh, some of what has been espoused as what drove the people, um, in particular in Saskatchewan, uh, to want to work together, to look after one another's needs, some values of equity and uh, inclusion and community, as John mentioned, um, were challenged now by the context in which we live. So advancing technology, and it was mentioned about people's expectations have changed. The expectations of a new generation for what they are entitled to, how they will access it, um, and have we learned enough about that? I think some of the culmination of our discussion was really that public participation is the answer to wrestling with the questions we have about vision and values. That if people start sharing, and there is the intergenerational, just like in the education system as well, the intergenerational uh, picture of what someone who's 21, what someone who is 61, and what someone who is 91 want from the system, and how do they share their past experiences or their anticipation for the future. And uh, Betsy threw out a challenge to our group as well about the idea that uh, given that we know some different things now about what creates health, uh, how about a public discourse on whether or not 10% of our dollars in the system, in the healthcare system right now, should be redirected towards education, knowing that a good education foundation may be what drives people's health better um, than some of the interventions that we do now. So uh, all in all, it was a very lively discussion combining um, a, a question of whether or not our values are the same, whether our vision in the past has worked for us, and then what we need as a vision to go forward. 
Um, and as I had been anticipating some of the, the discussion today, I had looked at um, whether or not it would be possible for us to create a vision that was something that we could continue to adapt as we go forward over the next 50 years, rather than having to reinvent the vision every five years, and had posed the question, which we didn't have time to answer, which is, do we have some ways of measuring how successful we are? Um, can we set some goals and say, we will know we have achieved our vision if such and such happens. If there is this increase in the literacy rate, uh, this much increase or decrease in the amount of chronic diseases or any number of things along those lines, can we come up with some tangible things? Again, our answer was, we will do so by all working together and trying to find it. Just one other thing that I had right at the end, um, I had looked up uh, the definition of a vision. I don't normally do that, and I know it's a bit trite, but uh, the Concise Oxford Dictionary actually gave to me what I thought I would leave, and I didn't get a chance to tell our group this morning, but leave as food for thought. And it, it gave a third definition after what we would normally think is the first two, and it said it's a combination. A vision is a combination of imaginative insight statesmanlike foresight and sagacity in planning. And uh, so maybe as we try to figure out who we are, where we're going, and why, we will have the answers to that vision. Thanks. So first of all, my thanks to uh, Cheryl Stanichuk uh, for facilitating my session and Andrea Paperplane Cessna for taking the notes. Um, is, your, is your display still on at the library, Andrea? Yeah. Go see wonderful photography from Andrea at the main library here in the city. It's fantastic. Uh, our session was on uh, public policy and political decision making. And uh, well, that meant for a, made for a really interesting discussion. Uh, we had people from all different walks of life and, and lots of different input. We started off with a bit of historical perspective and we were lucky enough to have Lorna, a historian in the, in the session who provided us with some really good background about the political climate at the time in the late 50s, early 60s when this was introduced. And one area that he focused on and, and became a focus of the discussion was the role of the trade union movement at that time and just how influential the labor movement was at helping to set the stage for the possibility of Medicare. Another element that was discussed as we transitioned from talking about the historical context to the current, uh, and, and John mentioned this, a family-focused uh, society rather than a community focus. There's a lot of, of reflection about the common experience that many of us have. Uh, most of the folks in the room talked about an experience that I had as well, growing up in a small town or on a farm and having a sense of community and how that has changed over time with rural urban transition or just changes in the way that we interact with each other so that people are far less focused on a community organization and far more on either individual or their immediate circle. And that really does impact how we can organize and, and it's a big change in the political climate. In terms of the, the sense of community in that room and, and the conversation was really led by who was around and I think that's, that's an important part of what uh, the CCPA has allowed us to do today is have a, an example of the type of <coughs> political organization, community organization that needs to happen by having a citizens conference. The citizens in our room were mostly uh, in one way or another connected to the labor movement and so we had a lot of, a, a lot of discussion about the role of labor and about the attack on that movement in, in the current political climate and just how difficult that makes it for not just the labor movement but for other collective organization including the ability to defend Medicare or to, or to propose new changes. Some of the things that we di discussed in how could that be addressed, what could be done differently uh, were around the need for secession planning, the need to engage a new generation uh, you talk about medical education, but we need to be looking at this about social, ac social accountability in all aspects of, of training, as well as community education, going beyond the walls of the ivory tower. We discussed the role of organizations like Next Up. I know I saw a few folks here from Next Up today. This is a really great program where uh, young people 
uh, here and in other cities across Western Canada are getting trained in, basically trained in community leadership and, and activism by connecting to leaders within social movements. So that's one example how labor movement, political activism, uh, activism around Medicare, that sort of advocacy, or the health professions can move from a situation of defending what we have to a, which is inevitably that defensive position, it's, it's prone to erosion. When you're just trying to say we need to keep what we have, that's how you lose it. You need to go into expansion and improvement. You need to value what's been done historically, but also be looking at what are the next stages. And if you look back to 1962, that excitement around Medicare, that excitement around the establishment, we don't have that sense right now. And how can we invoke a new kind of excitement? And some of that can be done through changes within the healthcare system. Uh, we talked about the My Better Medicare uh, program, mybettermedicare.ca, I believe, if you want to look it up. Uh, very neat uh, program from across the country, folks looking at examples of innovation within the public system that have saved money and improved care without having to uh, actually mess with the single-payer public, publicly funded system. There's innovations like that, innovations like Mr. Romano described around pharmacare, home care, long-term care, the important changes in primary health care that need to happen. But to really get to the next level of exciting people and engaging in the real value question here, which isn't around health care, it's around health. Uh, health care is a tool to get to our common goal of healthier lives. We need to talk about what makes a real difference in health. We heard a lot in today's session about poverty, about disability, about housing, about social inclusion, the social determinants of health. And we know that that's what makes a real difference. Healthcare is important, but it's 10th or 11th or 12th on the list of things that have a big impact on health outcomes, way behind income, education, housing, nutrition, social supports. And that, I think, is a challenge because it can be hard to really come up with a, a cohesive way of describing that, but it's also a real opportunity because health itself is something people care about and it allows us a new frame. It allows us a way to talk about how we can increase the equality in society, address the determinants of health, and do so in a way that improves the health of all people and connect to something they really value. So that was, the, that was the discussion that we had. I, uh, I, was, I found myself sympathizing with governments that are trying to fund healthcare in a time of shrinking budgets, as I was trying to summarize an hour and a half of discussion in eight minutes. Uh, but I, I thank you very much for the participation in the session and for inviting me today.